Okay, in this video we're going to talk about the Doppler effect. First things first, we need to learn about a wavefront diagram. You can find this term in your uh, packet of basic wave terms, and you should know what a wavefront diagram is and how to use it. In short, a wavefront diagram is a two-dimensional picture of a wave, usually a bird's eye view. So, for example, if you would imagine, let's say this is a, a bunch of plain um, water that's calm, and you have a water bug on the water that's jumping up and down, okay, creating these small ripples. These ripples ripple outward, and each of these lines, uh, these concentric circles, represents the wavefront diagram. Each of these lines represents the crest of the wave. Now, you can measure the wavelength by measuring the distance from crest to crest, or the distance between these two lines. You just got to make sure you measure uh, in the direction the wave is traveling itself. On a wavefront diagram, the waves are always traveling perpendicular to the wavefront. So this arrow is showing which way the waves are traveling in this location, at this location, and this arrow is showing which way it's traveling at this location. You can tell in both cases that direction the waves are traveling is perpendicular to the wavefront. So if you were to measure the wavelength, you'd always measure from here to here along the pa this path. You want to measure from this ring to this ring like that. That's too long. Okay, so we're going to talk about, like I said, the Doppler effect. And we need to understand wavefront diagrams in order to look at the Doppler effect. In short, the Doppler effect is simply the idea that when a, a wave is created, the frequency an observer detects for the wave may not always be the actual frequency of the original source. This is very frequent and happens a lot in a lot of examples with sound. So for example, if something is making a sound, it, you actually might, it might be making a specific frequency, but you might hear a different frequency. An example of this is, uh, let's say there's a robber trying to hide from the cops, and a police car is driving by looking for the robber. If the sirens are on, it would sound a little bit like this and tell me well you can't tell me but think about whether or not this sounds familiar so the police car would get uh, as it drives by would have a higher pitch uh, and then uh, as it's driving towards the robber would have a higher pitch and then as it passes the robber would have a lower pitch this is called the Doppler effect. The frequency that the, that the observer, the criminal, heard it was too high or too low compared to what it was actually making. So down low is a graph of what this might look like. If the observer is at this location here, okay, on the graph, and this is the frequency. Now the original frequency, like if the car was standing still, would be something uh, at this frequency, this level right here. But as the object the source is traveling towards the observer the frequency heard which is this blue line will be higher than the actual frequency it's emitting and then as soon as it passes it it becomes a lower frequency a good analogy for the Doppler effect would be um, let's say we're having a paintball war and Mr. T is over here with his green paintball uh, gun which he has rigged so it's fully automatic and over here is oh let's say Ani and I am shooting uh, paintballs at Ani and you can see here this flashing light flashes every time I fire a paintball and over here the flashing light flashes every single time it hits Ani now the frequency at which the paintballs leave my paintball gun is the same as the frequency at which it hits Ani. So the frequency of the source is equal to the frequency of the observation. Now this is because both of us are standing still. Now let's say uh, I'm getting a little bored with this and I just want to destroy Ani even more so and humiliate him and so I now start running towards Ani. Okay? Now, what happens if I run towards Ani? Well, the frequency you'll notice over here goes up, while the frequency I'm firing at is still the same. You'll also notice that the paintballs are actually a little bit closer together than when I was standing still. This is because um, I fire one paintball, and where normally the next time I fire, I'll still be here, 
Now I'm a little bit closer and I'm moving with the paintball. So the distance between each paintball is smaller and therefore the frequency goes up because it'll hit it more often. Okay, this would be very similar to if I had a, a wave, like a sound wave and a moving source and I was standing here like this and those sound waves will hit me more often because they're jammed closer together. Okay, as it just sits here, the waves on the front will, are closer together so they'll hit more often. Another example is if I'm, I'm thinking, okay, well, I don't know why Ani's not moving. Maybe I've duct taped him to the ground, but I, I've decided, hey, you know what? Killing Ani in the game is kind of fun. So, I don't know, let's, uh, let's make him suffer a little bit more. So instead of shooting him while running towards him, what if I run away? So that way it prolongs his pain and suffering. So instead, I'm now running away and you'll notice that the frequency is now less, the observed frequency is now less than the frequency of the source. This is because similar, similarly as before, the distance now is getting greater since I'm moving farther back. And so that distance between each paintball is now larger, even though the frequency of the shooting is the same. Again, this is similar to if it's a sound wave, you're standing right here because the waves behind it are stretched out, it'll be a lower frequency than the waves in front and, and a lower frequency than the original wave itself. Another way that you can get uh, a Doppler effect or a difference in the perceived frequency is to have instead of the source moving, you have the observer moving. So in this case, Ani is still being pegged, but this time he decides to run. So he's thinking, hey, this is really unfair. Mr. T has rigged this fully automatic paintball gun and I just have this little pea shooter of a paintball gun. And he's like, this is stupid. I'm just gonna end this quick and kill myself as fast as I can. Of course, I mean, commit suicide in the game, right? So he says, okay, I'll just run into these paintballs so it kills me faster. So. Uh, Ani starts running into them. Now, the distance between the paintballs are now still the same. And uh, these speed, the speed of the paintballs are still the same. The source frequency is still the same. But because Ani is running into it, it appears that the paintballs are moving slightly faster and it actually hits them more often. You can see that, that uh, light is flashing more often than the source. So again, the perceived frequency is higher. So um, this is again similar to um, like the bullets appear to be going faster even though they're not relative to the ground. They appear to be going faster to him. This is similar to if you're in a car, um, let's say on the highway, and you're traveling one way on the highway and someone else is traveling another way on the highway. Well, it looks like that car going the other way is going really, really, really fast. If you're both going 60 miles per hour, uh, it look, feels like you're standing still while the car passing you is really going like 120 miles per hour, even though it's not. So this would be like if my source was stationary. The wavelengths are equal on all sides, um, as a stationary source would be, but if I'm running into the waves, right, they'll hit me more often, okay? Those wave fronts will hit me more often, and the frequency observed will be higher. So in the case of sound, that means when I run towards the source, it sounds like a higher pitch. All right, and the last example is if, what if Ani is running away? Don't ask me why, but he's trying to escape and he apparently isn't bright enough to run sideways or anything. Instead, I don't know, maybe he's in a corridor or maybe he's just not that bright, I don't know. Uh, so maybe he's just running away from the source straight away and I'm still pegging him. Now, I'll still hit him, but it will be less frequently. You'll notice this light is flashing significantly less frequently. This would be, again, the same thing, but now I am on this side and I'm running away and the waves will hit me less often as I run away and so it will uh, be a lower frequency. All right, so let's learn how to actually calculate the perceived frequency if we knew how fast 
people were moving and the original frequency. So in, in one of our first examples, we had the uh, observer be the one, or one of our examples, we had the observer be the one moving. So if I had a stationary source creating waves, but I had an observer running into the waves, first thing I need to do is qual qualitatively decide, does the frequency go up, down, or, um, well, does it go up or down, the perceived frequency? And so running towards, I would hit it more often, I would imagine, and so the frequency should be higher. So now let's actually figure out how to calculate it. So the frequency should be higher. We're going to calculate this. Um, we're going to start with our standard equation we always use, which is, excuse me, velocity equals wavelength times frequency. We'll rearrange for frequency because that's what we're trying to solve for. And then we'll have to say, all right, what is it that has caused this frequency to change? Well, remember, as the observer is moving, the thing is, is that the wavelength stays the same, but the speed of the wave appears greater. Now, this is something that not only should you be able to calculate, but they want you to be able to explain where these equations come from. So taking a note or two on uh, where those uh, these equations come from is a good idea and like how they were derived. So we would need to know, hey, we're just using our standard velocity equation, but then we are saying, hey, look, the new frequency or frequency prime, the observed frequency, frequency prime, is um, different because there's a new observed velocity. It appears that the wave is traveling faster while the wavelength is still the same. So we just need to figure out what is this new velocity? Well, as we saw before, when two objects are moving, we just find the relative velocity. We could, for example, if it's moving towards it, we would just add those two velocities together because it appears to be traveling faster. And uh, we get V plus UO, where V is the speed of the wave, the original speed of the wave, and UO is the speed of the observer. Now we have this in terms of the wavelength. We'd prefer it if it was in terms of the original frequency. So the original wavelength is equal to the original speed of the wave divided by the original frequency. It's the same equation, just rearranged. I can plug that in here for wavelength. It becomes this right here. And I just rearrange and I get this bad boy over here, which we'll talk about in a second. So for a observer going towards the source, we will have here a higher frequency and the equation can be calculated with this where F prime is the new observed frequency. F is the, um, F is the original and altered frequency. V is the speed of the wave in both cases, here and here, V is the speed of the wave. Uh, if it's a sound wave, it's just 343, uh, if it's at room temperature. And UO is the speed of the observer. Now you'll notice this is just a fraction, and this is V over V, but on top we're adding a number, so this is gonna be greater than one, this fraction, which means the frequency gets higher. Let's look at another circumstance. Let's say now the observer is running away. Now the reason why the frequency changes is the exact same reason as we discussed before. It's because the speed appears to be different, but this time the speed appears to be slower. So instead of doing the speed of the wave plus the speed of the observer, we're gonna do the exact opposite, minus, and this is the equation if the person's running away. So the original, or the perceived frequency, F prime, is equal to the original unaltered frequency times this fraction of uh, speed of the wave minus speed of the observer divided by speed of the wave. This here will be a fraction that's less than one because it's subtracting a number on top. And so therefore the new frequency will be lower, which is what we would expect too, because the waves are, we are just thinking about it, like in our paintball example, the waves will hit the person less often. Now let's do an example and see the equation when instead of the observer is moving, the source is moving. Now remember, what causes a Doppler effect when the source is moving is different. 
As this observer is standing still, it still appears that the waves are moving just as fast as they used to. But the difference is, is that the waves are jammed closer together. So the wavelength itself has changed. So in this case, if you're standing in front, because the waves are jammed closer together, the, the waves will, but it has the same speed, the waves will hit you more often and this frequency will appear to be higher. All right, so let's derive the equation for if the source is moving. It's pretty much the same thing as before. We're going to do uh, velocity equals lambda f, free range for f. But this time it's going to be the perceived frequency is uh, equal to the velocity, which has not changed because it's the same medium and the observer is not moving. But it's the wavelength that has changed this time. So the new observed frequency has changed because of this new wavelength. Now the new wavelength is going to be a little tricky to explain. But the new wavelength, the observed wavelength, sorry, this should be, say lambda prime, equals uh, still velocity over frequency, right? But the new velocity, it's like, a, as far as the wave's concerned, the wave feels like it's going uh, slower because the only way to explain why those waves are jammed closer together would be that the waves are, you know, if it sees that according to the waves perspective, if the frequency is the same, um, the only way to explain why that wavelength is getting smaller is that, hey, it must be slower. That's why there's not as much distance between me and the wave in front of me. So we would say that the velocity of the wave minus the velocity of the source it divided by frequency is equal to, this should say lambda prime. I can take this stuff, I can plug it in here, I can rearrange and I get this equation here, which we'll talk about in a moment. So for when a source is moving towards the observer, we have a very similar equation as we had the last time, uh, but this time we are talking about the speed of the source and it's on the bottom. And so if it's moving towards I would the, the observer, the frequency I would expect to go higher, which means this number on the bottom of the fraction I need smaller. Hence it's subtracted and this fraction is a number less than one. Where f prime is the observed frequency, f is the uh, original unaltered frequency, v is the speed of the wave itself, in this case often the speed of sound, and then us is the speed of the source and of course we would expect the frequency to get higher because this fraction is is greater than one since the bottom number is is uh, smaller all right and then our last example is the same thing as we just had but this time the source is moving away from the observer uh, so we, it's the exact same equation, but this time we want a lower frequency. We know we want a lower frequency because the waves are more spread out in the back and therefore it should hit the person less often. Um, in this case, to make it lower, right, it's just going to have to change the sign here to a plus. That makes this a larger number and therefore this fraction is less than one and therefore uh, this perceived new perceived frequency will be a lower frequency. All right, let's sum it all up. Here are all four equations written out the way they write it in your yellow packet on the IB test. So in fact, I, they might even put the moving the observer, moving observer and moving source above the two equations, those two notes, that would be really nice. Although even if they don't, it's not that big of a deal because you can quickly tell because this says UO for observer and US for source. But these are the two equations that they give you. You're welcome to pull out your yellow packet and take a look at those two equations so you know where to find them. Um, you'll find it in, the, uh, in, the, in option A uh, of your yellow packet. Now, this, uh, let's go over this equation just one more time. F again is the observed frequency. F, sorry, F prime is the observed frequency. F is the original unaltered frequency from the source. 
V is the speed of the wave, UO is the speed of the object, or sorry, observer, and US is the speed of the source. The only tricky part is always remembering whether it's plus or minus. And that's not too bad if you just simply uh, remember or think about it and know what you would expect the answer to be, whether it be a higher frequency or lower frequency. You're welcome to memorize it. It's backwards for the two different equations. P plus for towards on observer, minus for away. Uh, plus for away for if the source is moving and minus if it's towards. However, easiest way is to just think about it. For example, if the observer is moving, let's say, towards the source, then I would say, okay, well, if it's moving towards the source, I would expect that frequency to get higher because it's running into the waves more often. And so let's see here, I need plus here because I want this number on top to be bigger. Similarly, you can do the same with the moving, moving uh, source instead of the observer. If you say, hey, look, uh, let's say the source is moving towards the observer, I would also expect the waves to hit them more often because um, it, the wavelength shrinks in front and compresses. So that means, uh, let's see here, I want this to be greater than one, and so therefore let, I should minus because then this will be a smaller number on the bottom. So minus must be towards. And so you just have to think about it before you start according to the situation in order to set up the equation correctly. Here's an example for you to try your calculations. Give it a try and pause the video if you'd like. All right, so if we were to solve for this, we first want to do what we always do, identify our variables. A car is honking its horn while it's driving towards you at 30 meters per second. This makes it sound like the source itself is moving. So I know that 30 meters per second is US, the speed of the source. The horn has a frequency of 460 hertz. That makes it sound like that's the original unaltered frequency so that it would be F. And though it doesn't say it, I know it's a sound. And so therefore the speed of the wave must be something close to 344 or 330, 343 or something like that if it's at room temperature. So I'm going to use this equation. Now, should I use plus or minus? Right, the one for the source, should I use plus or minus? Well, it's moving towards the, the, uh, so the observer, so I'd expect it to be a higher frequency, in which case I'll use minus down here, so that way it will be a fraction greater than one. And we get our answer is 504 hertz, which I stop and make sense and say, does that make sense? And I think, yes, it does, because it's actually a higher frequency as I would expect. Another example. You're welcome to pause it and give it a try. Okay, so in this one, the car is moving now away from the source. It is just past, or sorry, the observer. It is just past the observer. And so it's the exact same problem as before, except now I've just got to change the sign. Same variables, same everything. I just now have a plus in the bottom because it's moving away and the frequency should go down. Therefore, I want a bigger number on the bottom of the fraction and I will get a smaller frequency, observed frequency, which is what I have here. The next question we have to face is what do we do then if this is light, right? This, this Doppler effect equation works for all kinds of waves, whether it be sound, water waves, anything. But the problem is, is when we talk about light, light goes really, really fast. And there's a problem that we have when things go really, really fast. According to the theory of special relativity, uh, while other objects appear to be moving faster or slower, have relative speeds, right? So, for example, if you have a uh, car, some guy driving in a car passing by you and throws a ball at you, the total speed of the ball while you're standing still on the road would appear to be the speed of the car plus how fast you threw the ball. But relative to the guy in the car, it looks like the ball is only moving as fast as how, how fast he threw it. This is what we call what we mean by relative speed. 
Well, unfortunately, with all reference frames, uh, light always appears to be going the same speed no matter what. This causes some strange things to happen. And so this equation doesn't fully work uh, when we deal with light. So we have to modify it with some other equations that we're not going to go into because they have to do with relativity and we haven't learned that. So we're going to modify this equation so it works for light. And here it is. So if you have light, this is called the redshift equation, and it is actually an approximation of the redshift equation. Uh, and this is what they give to you on your IB test, which is again also found on option A in your yellow packet. And it's a little bit different than the other one. Instead of F prime, they have delta F, where delta F is how much your frequency changed from before. V is the speed, of, or, sorry, is no longer the speed of the wave, but it is the relative speed of the source, how fast the source is moving, uh, or appears to be moving. And then C is the speed of light in a vacuum, which is a constant and is always about 3.00 times 10 to, the, uh, 10 to the eighth. And then F is the original frequency. Now this equation only works when the velocity of the object is much, much less than C or the speed of light in a vacuum. Now, when I say much, much less, I mean as long as it's 100 times less than 3 times 10 to the 8th. That means you could still be going 300, or sorry, 3 million meters per second, and this equation would approximately work. So, as far as we're concerned, it usually works in most cases. Here's an example we can look at. Uh, let's say there's a star that I'm looking at. The redshift equation is most often used with stars. This is because the universe is expanding and all objects are therefore moving away from us. And so someone might observe a star and observe or um, note that the light, the frequency from the light coming from the star should be this frequency here. Uh, and then they, but they measure the frequency to be this frequency here. And they might say, okay, well, this must be because the object is moving, um, right? So it's a, let's see here, it's a higher observed frequency, which would mean that the source is moving towards me. Now they can figure out how fast the star is moving uh, by using the equation. Just keep in mind, delta F is the change in frequency. So I have to find the difference, which is 0 0.1 times 10 to the 14th and plug it in where C is the speed of light, about 3.00 times 10 to the eighth, or 2.99. Um, and then the frequency uh, of the original expected source would be plugged in here for F, and I solve, and I get a velocity of 5.75 times 10 to the six meters per second, which is really, really, really fast. Now, in addition to knowing how to calculate the Doppler effect and to how to calculate the new frequency, um, you should know the applications for the Doppler effect. One of the most common applications is to find out how fast something's going. So usually we know the frequency of the wave that is being of the source, or we know the frequency when we can measure the frequency of the observed of the frequent the observed frequency, but we're usually trying to find out how fast it's going, because the Doppler effect it doesn't tell you where something is. It's not echolocation. This is something that is affected by how fast the object is moving. So whenever we want to know how fast something's moving, this is a great use the Doppler effect. So a good use for this would be radar guns. Now you'll notice what happens is, is the police officer sends a wave down, which the radar gun knows the original wave. It comes, it hits a moving car, it comes and it, or it bounces back and he then observes the wave and sees by how much, or at least the device does, sees by how much that frequency has changed. The bigger the change, the faster the car is moving. Now this actually brings up an interesting point. If you have a situation like this, where there's two waves, one that bounces off of something, comes back, and then is observed, there's actually two different Doppler effects. The first one is when the wave is sent towards the car, 
and the car is the observer observing this this incoming black wave and the policeman is the source and so this is one you would use the equation to figure out the observed frequency by the car uh, and you'd use the um, moving observer a Doppler equation but on the reflected wave now the source is moving and the observer, the source is the moving car because the reflected waves coming from the car. And the observer, which is the policeman, is the one that is stationary. So if I wanted to, so there's another Doppler effect again when the policeman sees the wave. And so if I wanted to measure the new uh, change in frequency, it would be using the moving source equation. So you can either do the Doppler effect twice find the new perceived frequency, then plug it in to the next one, um, and then solve. Or you could just combine the two equations, and it turns out pretty algebraically simple. It looks like this, where this is used if uh, in a situation like this, where there's two waves, it bounces off an object and is observed. So the source is both move, or sorry, the observer is moving when the wave comes towards the car. And then the source for the reflected wave is the thing that's moving um, for the, ref the bounce back reflected wave. You can just combine the two and just solve all in one go. Note though that the speed of the observer uh, is the car because he's the one that observed the incoming wave. And the speed of the source is also the speed of the moving car because he's the source of the reflected wave. So these two are the same. Luckily the fractions don't cancel out though because in the first case, I would expect the frequency to be higher for the observer, so this is a plus on top. And in the second case, it gets higher again because the source is now moving towards the observer, and so this is a minus. So while the velocities of the wave are both the same, the um, speed of the observers are both the same. The, uh, you would have a plus speed of the observer and speed of the source is the same. You'd have a plus on one side and minus, and so this is a fraction that will not necessarily just cancel out. Another example of a use for the Doppler effect is they use it to find blood clots, or really bad blood clots in veins. What they do is they have this device that sends out an ultrasonic wave, and that ultrasonic wave will bounce off of moving blood vessels, or uh, moving uh, blood cells, and so uh, as it hits the moving blood cells, it comes back kind of like the radar gun, and then it'll see how fast it's moving. This allows people to uh, spot blood clots because according to fluid dynamics, um, what happens is, is when a, a pipe has moving fluid in it and the, the, surf, the cross-sectional area of the pipe is restricted, so in other words, it gets narrow like this, the water or fluid speeds up at those places. This is like as if you're watering your garden with a hose and you put your thumb over the opening so it's like halfway over the opening and you'll notice the water shoots out faster and farther. So the same thing happens so, uh, with blood vessels and so they look for places where the speed is abnormally high and they know, okay, that must be a location where there's a blood clot. The last thing we wanna go over is uh, what happens when the speed of the source uh, is actually going faster than the speed of the wave. So I want you to imagine this is a blank thing of water and it's nice and calm. And there's a water bug, bug though jumping up and down on the water causing these ripples. If the water bug is stationary, this is what it would look like. If the water bug is moving, it would look like this. And we've already seen this, right? Where the waves are compressed on one side and stretched out on the other. Well, what if the water bug was moving at the same speed of the wave itself? Well, that means it would create a wave, and then by the next time it creates the wave, it would still be on top of that wave itself, because the wave never actually got away from the source. And so you'd be making wave on top of another wave, and it would look something like this. Okay, and you'll notice here, there's a lot of lines that are overlapping at this location. This means that there's, the, remember, all these lines are crests, right? So that means there's a lot of crests on top of each other, which means this would actually create um, a, a large uh, constructive interference wave. It would be a very large wave up front. Now, what if the bug actually went faster than the speed of the wave? Okay, it would look something like this. 
Okay, and now this hopefully it looks something like a speedboat, okay, where it's a V in the back, and these waves overlap here, uh, and thus creating uh, constructive interference and a very large wave, which on a speedboat is a wake. Now this can happen with sound as well. It's really hard to go faster than the speed of sound because there's this large compression wave. Remember, sound is a longitudinal wave, so the uh, it, it creates compressions instead of crests. And so this is a lot of compression right here, and it's hard for the airplane to get past. Once the airplane does get past, though, it looks something like this. And if an observer was standing right here when the airplane passed by, and this large amount of compression hit their eardrum, it would sound like a very loud pop, uh, pop or boom, which we call the sonic boom. A sonic boom is created by going faster than the speed of sound and creating that large uh, amplitude, that large um, constructive interference in front. And uh, other examples of this would be when uh, an, uh, you crack a whip, that's a sonic boom because the little ends of the tassels on the end of the whip goes faster than the speed of sound. Here's some pictures to kind of help out with uh, what a sonic wave looks like. Okay, um, again, the, with the speedboat, right, you'll notice there's the V shape, and this is a large wave caused by superposition of all those waves behind it. Now, this speedboat is going significantly faster than the speed of the wave, so this is a very elongated V. Here's a picture of an airplane going faster than the speed of sound, and you'll notice again this cone shape. Now this is a cone shape that looks like a cloud, and the reason why is because when you compress moisture in air, it will condense and form a cloud. So this high compression area has basically condensed the water vapor into a cloud, and you can actually see the V shape of the wave.